Hi everyone. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different and I want to talk about two relatively new SMB overflow exploits, SMB Ghost and SMBleed, paired together very commonly referred to as SMBleed and Ghost. These vulnerabilities on their own are interesting enough, but researchers at ZecOps, a cybersecurity automation company, have demonstrated that SMB Ghost can lead to privilege escalation and SMBleed can lead to information leaks, but where it really gets interesting to me is that there's the potential to chain the two together in order to get unauthenticated remote code execution on a target machine. So that means that in order to get lateral movement and privilege escalation, all it needs is for a machine to be vulnerable. You don't, know, you don't need to know anyone's username or password as long as you already have access. In order to understand the basic concept behind these vulnerabilities, I just want to take a step back and cover the basics of overflow tactics to you. And in order to understand that, we need to understand program memory and how it works at the CPU level. When a binary app is executed, it'll allocate memory in a very specific way and inside the boundary defined by modern computers. Pieces of memory are all assigned an address and located between the lowest and highest memory addresses, we'll be able to find the stack. You may have heard of a stack before, stack overflow, stack exchange, uh, programmers just referring to the stack, but if not, here's how it works. When a thread is running, it runs code within a program image or call DLLs loaded into it. In order to do this, it requires a short-term data area where things like functions, variables, or control information can be housed. This house is the stack. Stack memory is viewed last in, first out where items pushed onto the top of a stack are popped off first. These push and pop functions are housed within assembly code and maintain the order of the stack. As items are popped and code within a thread calls functions, it needs to know where to return once it's complete. Memory is dynamic, so it won't always return to the same location, so it'll need a reference point. That return address, along with the function parameters, are stored in a frame within the stack. And once it ends, the address is referred to and the process will return to where it previously left off. Since the stack constantly changes, it'll use a series of pointer to help create a reference point, the ESP, the EBP, and the EIP. ESP is the most recently referenced location with a pointer to a memory point. Since the stack is constantly changing, it can be difficult to locate this on its own. The EBP solves that problem by storing a pointer back to its top of the stack. And the EIP, which always points to the next point of code to be executed, is a primary target for buffer overflow exploits because if you can hijack that next point of code where it's pointing, you can get your own code to run. So what is an overflow, technically? When an application or a function doesn't properly sanitize user input, a hacker can craft an argument that will make use of that. You'll be able to effectively create your own payload and slide it into that buffer, overflowing its set limits. And from there, you can lead to an overwrite of something like that return address. So you slide enough information in that you then alter the return address, which you can hijack and point back to your own code, thus leading to some level of exploitation. I found this analogy on Stack Exchange, and I think it's a pretty useful way of explaining the process. If we were going to dumb it down, you might think of an application like a recipe book on a freehold punch paper in a binder and a very dumb cook. The memory is the binder. The processor or CPU is the cook. People can add or remove pages from a binder much like a computer will load or unload programs and data in memory. The cook just follows every instruction on the page we're on, and the cook starts beginning on the opening page, the bootloader and it'll continue until the instruction is close book. Even if the instruction is to flip to another page, like turn to page 394, it'll keep going. So normally, you'd write on page one, turn to page 200 for waffles. Open up the binder and put in waffles at page 200, and then the cook will start. The cook should be making waffles. But wait, here comes an attacker. They've written notes, outside the margins of your, waffle, of your waffle recipe. That's outside the buffer, in this case. And the cook is going to execute those instructions, even though they're obviously handwritten. The, code was never, the cook rather, was never told to only do what's printed on the original sheet in terms of the buffer space, and 
the cook will also do anything after that, the memory after a buffer, or the margins in this case. Perhaps the cook is going to add vinegar to the waffle, in this case corrupting your memory files maybe? Perhaps the cook is going to turn to page 394 and just leave a raw egg sitting there unused until it rots and molds, maybe turning off your antivirus. Perhaps the cook throws away every single item in the kitchen, deleting all your files, or puts a lock on your kitchen door like ransomware would do to your files. Or maybe, in our case, it opens the window and installs a Trojan or backdoor so the attacker can just climb right in. That's the basic concept behind an overflow attack. It's writing those outside of margin instructions for you to get access on some level or perform some kind of instruction. So let's take a step into this vulnerability and see how it relates. Back in March, researchers at ZecOps found a way to exploit an escalation of privilege vulnerability out of parts of the SMB v3 protocol listed in CVE 2020-0796, or SMB Ghost. Within SMB, there's a driver called Serve2Sys, which houses a function exploited there, Serve2 Decompressed Data. Basically, that function receives a compressed message sent by the client and puts aside the required amount of memory before decompressing the data. As long as the offset of a buffer isn't zero, it's going to copy the data placed before the compressed data as is to the start of a new allocated buffer. So if you have anything before it, afterwards, it's gonna be copied to the new model. The ZecOps researcher also found two fields within the function that were ripe for an integer overflow, which occurs when an operation attempts to create a numeric value that's outside the range, which can be represented with a given number of digits. So similar to the overflow tactics before, but just with numbers. These two fields were the offset field and the original compressed segment size field. With enough time and experimentation, they found that sending a legitimate offset size but a massive segment size would generate some interesting results, and the process kind of looked like this. It would allocate the amount of bytes, which would then be smaller than the sum of both fields due to the integer overflow. Then it would move on to decompression. The decompression will receive a huge original compressed segment value, treating the target buffer as practically having a limitless size. All the other parameters are unaffected and thus it'll work as expected, and it might not even ever get to the third step, which is copy, but if it does get there, it's going to work as expected. Whether or not it ended up working didn't really matter, because at this point, they were able to trigger the out-of-bounds memory right during the decompressed stage, and since they allocated less bytes than necessary to handle such a large size. From there, it was just a matter of a team being able to figure out how to use that memory. Eventually, they ended up using a well-known technique from 2012 by Caesar Sir in his Black Hat presentation on easy local Windows kernel exploitation. So this technique is almost 10 years old at this point, and it's still being used, which I find pretty interesting. The technique leverages leaking the current process token by using the NT Query System Information API, then overriding that and granting the current process token privileges that can be used for privilege escalation. Combining their research and that tactic, the team completed a successful privilege escalation by modifying their process tokens to inject a DLL into winlogon.exe. That DLL's purpose was to launch a privilege session of command prompt, thus escalating the user. And that's just half of the chain. The second half of the chain just came out this week after Microsoft's June Patch Tuesday revealed the same vulnerability could also result in an information leak. The same researchers that worked on SMB Ghost came back to that serve to decompress function we talked about, and this time they asked a different question. They asked, what if, instead of a massive original compressed file size, they only send something that's just a bit larger than the original? And what they found was that they were able to append the difference onto the buffer, resulting in that amount of uninitialized kernel data being added to the new frames. So for this exploit, they used SMB2 write messages to demonstrate the capabilities. The structure contains fields where the amount of bytes to write and flags are designated as well as a variable length buffer. So in this case, they would then be able to specify the header, 
and the variable length buffer would also be able to contain the uninitialized kernel value data. On its own, that proof of concept requires credentials and a writable share, which are pretty available if you've met most network admins, but the bug applies to every message, so it can potentially be exploited without authentication. Another interesting point found was that the leaked memory is from a previous allocations in the non-paged pool and X pool. And since they controlled the allocation size, they could potentially control the data that's being leaked. Where this team really kind of shined, in my opinion, was how they were able to take both of these exploits and chain them together into something crazy. As of the time of filming this right now, which is June 12th, there isn't a technical write-up on it, but a proof, a proof of concept has been released demonstrating that combining SMB Ghost and SM Bleed can lead to an unauthenticated remote code execution scenario. Only a few versions of Windows are currently impacted by this, being versions 2004, 1909, and 1903, but you've got a few options in terms of remediation here. You can patch your systems, which would make me very happy. The latest cumulative patch for Microsoft Windows security covers these vulnerabilities, or you could just block port 445, preventing any kind of lateral movement there. And there are two other options involving enabling host isolation or disabling SMB 3.1.1 compression, but we're not going to go into that here. For now, I just wanted to point out that this awesome pair of vulnerabilities uh, are out there and recognize the team that made the POC code. I hope this video was helpful and engaging. I just wanted to make this because I've been doing some research on it over the past week and found it really fun to look at. And I'm going to include some links to the ZecOps team blog where I read, did a lot of reading on this, uh, as well as to the GitHub pages with the POC code. I fully plan on trying this against my own test lab system. And as always, only do this if, with your own lab system. Don't do it against any live audiences, please. Uh, but you know, my audience is so small, I really don't think that many people are going to see that to try it in the first place. But if there's any kind of topic you want to hear about, any hack the box machines you'd like me to have a go at, or any kind of topics you really just think should be covered, please leave a comment like, I will respond. There's 35 of you. It's not like I'm drowning in questions. So thank you for listening. I really appreciate you taking the time on this one. That's something that I'm passionate about. and I hope to do more of these. Have a good day.